Well, thanks for speaking with me today. Um, uh, we, got, we got a lot to talk about today and um, some uh, some fun visuals too, I hope. Yeah, I got it at the end. So if you okay. like it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, you guys are just coming off a European tour, which you finished in March. Um, how did that go? It went great. Yeah, it was a it was a short tour, I think a month um, compared to last summer, we did like almost three months. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about it is this last European tour, we finally have done all the songs from Dog Girl because we only did three of them in the, in the last yeah. previous tour. So we, we finally got them all down under our belt now. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I've always been curious, how do you prepare for these high energy shows that the Pixies are known for, in which a lot of times you're out there playing for two hours? Yeah. Yeah. Because we do a two hour set with no talking. It's just bang, 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 bang. But yeah. it's like riding a bike, you know, um, you know, um, uh, just to build the stamina up. I usually get maybe just practicing at home and stuff like that on um, for only an hour at a time. But it's really not when the shows kick in, you know, like that. Couple of days into it, it's like okay, now I'm back in the swing of it because it's a whole different animal playing live where I'm really kind of into it compared yeah. to home where I'm really just comfortable and I can do things on this drum set which I can't do live because I'm <laughs> going crazy. But um, yeah, yeah, but it's good and it's it's nice because sometimes you know, you know, we always meet like the day of either the show or a day before to rehearse. Because we've it's like riding a bike. We've done this for yeah. so many years. But the funny thing is, you know, I practice a lot. I get there and everyone's like, oh, I haven't played guitar in about a year or something. <laughs> so I got to sit through it. And, and at least it builds up my stamina on the way, Brooke. So, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure these long shows are much easier now, now that you've had your hand surgery. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience recovering from carpal tunnel surgery and how it oh. has affected your drumming? Oh, it's great. Yeah, because it was, um, you know, before we, when COVID hit, um, mm -hmm. we were on that tour, I think Australia or New Zealand, and it was getting a little dicey because, you know, I've been dealing with it for a long time. And the playing, it was just like I had to like, oh, shake my hands out. It was getting tough, really tough. And I actually thought, you know, like I previously said, like, oh, no, I'm not going to be able to keep up with this. And then COVID, by the grace, <laughs> like that kind of got me uh off off doing that and i was able to get the hand surgery on both hands and i don't know if i told the story already you know with where they did one hand first they can't do the other yeah so they did one hand first and then they did this next one and you're awake when they do it so i'm watching them do it and when they cut down they use a little like a with a the camera with the cutters that go in there and do it and then a month later i went back and this it's taking him a long time it's like what's you know what's going on what's you know it's taken away and the doctor said well we can't see in there because it's so inflamed so we're gonna have to go through the top so they made another incision through the top and i'm watching that and then they had to stop and they're going even longer and it's like well, what's going on and they said well you know something there's a muscle that most people have here that is just a small muscle mm -hmm. and mine was enormous and it's all from playing traditional grip that's what it was playing traditional good drums. Yeah. I just built the muscle up. So they had to move that out of the way, get in there and fix it. But after I was recovered, it was just like, I'm back to normal. I can ride a bike. I can hold my phone. I can drum. I can do everything. And because of that, I decided I'm going to change it up again because for when I first started out on drums, I was playing traditional grip, like the jazz drummers. That's the way I learned. Then with the Pixies, you know, I'm, I'm playing in a kind of a punk band and everyone else is playing, you know, match grip. So I decided I'll learn match grip. So I learned match grip. I did that for a long, long time. Then when the Pixies started up again in 2004, I was playing match grip. And then I decided, let's change it up. And I went back to traditional grip. And that's the way I played up all the way to the COVID until the hand surgery. And then I decided, decided let's change it up again. I'm back to match grip again right now. And do you and find group, that that's better? It's better because really you can set your drums up really just, you know, just in nice level lines. Whereas traditional grip, I had to have things tilted, crazy tilted extremes because I had to, you know, hit it like this. Yeah. And this is based on, you know, traditional grip is all based on, you know, fife and drum where you'd have a drum slung around your shoulder. And the only way to play it because it was at an angle was playing traditional grip. So, I mean, that translated all the way through when drum sets started in the big band and previous to that, you know, jazz era. 
and it's carried all the way through. It looks great, and there's a certain finesse. I mean, I, I can get a buy on anything with it because I've, I've learned it since I was a kid. But with match grip, it's a lot, it's simple on a drum set. You can set a drum set up pretty simple. And luckily, my drum tech can sit down and check my drums now because <laughs> it's all right there. So, but it, it's, I like it better. I'm going to stay with that. At home, I just might mess around on, on the other way. But live, it just makes it a lot easier. I learned matchstick and I, I can't even imagine like traditional with, with the wrists. Like it's. Yeah. I'm a... well, yeah. It's just something we practice. That's all yeah. it is. You build yeah. up the muscles. And like I said, I've done it since I was a kid. So it's very easy, but I tried it the other day because I haven't been doing it a lot. It's like, Oh, I got to get those muscles back. <laughs> so. As you wrapped up the European tour, I noticed that the final show was in London on March 21st, which would have been the 35th anniversary of Surfer Rosa. That's how right. does, I, yeah. how does it feel to be celebrating the 35th anniversary of this legendary album? Well, it's 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 great. I mean, I I learned about it that day. I think I thought I saw it on social media. I I mean, I wouldn't have known, but <laughs> It's good. I mean, it marks another five years past since we did that whole Surfer Rosa kind of thing that we went out. It just makes me feel a little older and a, 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 at least I don't have a cane or a wheelchair to get me back and forth to the drum set. So it's no big deal, but it's just interesting how time does fly. You know? What do you think makes Surfer Rosa such an enduring and influential album, album even 35 years later after its release? Gosh, I mean, I, I look back on it fondly, Brooke, because, I mean, Silver Rose is my favorite album. Um, and I think it was just because, you know, you know, Come On Pilgrim was really, you know, demos and stuff and stuff that we learned. Silver Rosa was another album right after it that, you know, we knew how to play these songs. We played them in Boston. We played them in clubs. So they were easy to play. And it was kind of a progression. It was also, you know, it was a wonderful time in my life being a youth and being in a band and, it was it was it was wonderful and I'm not saying it's not wonderful now, but it was just fond, you know, memories and stuff like that that I have with it, especially. And that's why I think Surfer Rosa is to me at least. But when I listen to it, I mean, if you compare it to Doolittle or Bossa Nova or, or Trump Lamone or anything of that that period, I think Surfer Rosa for some reason resonates a little better because of just the it may reflect a certain time in the band as well as the recording is way different than than any of the any of the other albums where it was more of a live kind of in a live room so that gave it a different feel so i think because of that i think that's what's carried on it's just that there's something about it, the sound and the songs just are, are you know work together nice can you discuss any specific musical or technical aspects of surfer rosa that you feel were particularly innovative or unique at the time sure yeah to working with steve albini yeah um there were two things that stand out that he did that definitely make the sound of it that i think that we hadn't done in other, in other studios one was the drums uh the drums we had regular miking on the drums you know your close miking and then the overheads but what we had also was a it's called a pzm mic it's a um a pl placement zone microphone and what okay. it is is radio shack sells them sure makes them radio shack is no longer I'm, I'm heartbroken by that but um it's a little it's like a plate and there's a microphone at an angle and what you can do with these pzm mics is you can mount them on a wall so what steve did is on the other end of the studio where the drums were i mean every everybody played live in that room anyway there wasn't much separation but on the other end of the room up on the wall was taped a pzm mic and if you listen to, you know, any of Surfer Rosa, especially the drums, maybe on uh, Bone Machine, maybe, or something like that, you can hear that, um, that ambiance or whatever, the room sound. The room sound is really there. And that plays a big part, I think, of that record. That kind of, it gives it that live sound or that, mm -hmm. that feel. And that was the PZM mic. And if you notice, I'm a big Rush fan, but in one of the Rush videos, Neil Peart actually has one taped to his chest when he's recording his drums. So it gives it that kind of, you know, your drums are right there, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, PZM mics are fantastic. I even bought one because of it. I have it. I haven't even used it, but I have a PZM. But that was what gave it the sound and especially the drums on that. The other thing that Steve did 
that I remember was he had metal picks, guitar picks, that he gave, I think, Charles and Joe, was to play with metal picks rather than your plastic kind of picks. I don't know if they did it on every song, but it gives it, you know, metal on metal. It's a different sound altogether. So I think that was, an, that was another Albini kind of uh, uh, an idea on things that was used or so Rosa. Um, those two were the big ones. Those were the ones that stood out that made it different, or at least I've never seen before. How would you say the recording and release of that album impacted the Pixies' career and the trajectory of the band? It was definitely a progression. I mean, the first Come On Pilgrim, that originally was a demo. Um, and then we took some songs that we recorded and threw it together, or at least 4AD did. It made it Come On Pilgrim, which is the first album. Mm -hmm. um, Surfer Rosa... Uh, we started, I think we had some time where we were playing Come On Pilgrim. We had some other songs that Charles came up with and did that. I, what I think about Sofia Rosa, I mean, that, that whole experience, even going into the studio, that was the first time we went into, a, I would call it a real studio. I mean, Fort Apache is what we did, Come On Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. is. And that was, you know, that was a studio. It was it was fine. It was a, it was a for for somewhat of a great experience first experience for the pixies it was fantastic but then now you're stepping up to i can't even remember the name of it but whatever that studio was in boston that was like oh my god we're getting big time this is this is something else and it was i think a 16 track analog studio doing that was was great because it was a progression and i mean we didn't know any different you know we're we're just with the Pixies, it was just going like this. It was it was just wonderful. And Surfer Rosa comes out, and then we saw the album on 4AD, because now we were in with 4AD now, and they presented this album. It's like, whoa, you know, the, the whole look of the album and everything that it's, you know, this is actually, there's a formation, and this is starting to go through. So I think Surfer Rosa, it was, it was, it's, I wouldn't say it's better than Come On Pilgrim. It's, I mean, some of the songs are still the same on Silver Rosa that are on Come On Pilgrim. But it's a different animal as far as the sound and some of the newer songs on it. And I think it was definitely a progression of, or a, uh, a how would you say it? Just a natural thing of way, the way the Pixies were and where we were going in that way, the, the, at least the new material. Just and a I natural that, progression. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. And I think everything from Doolittle to, to Trump Lamone was just we're getting older and we're getting better at the craft and we think that we can do other things. I mean, reggae, I mean, I'm sure we could pull off some metal or something like that. I think that we I think, would love to see that. We think we think we can. We think we can do it because we're we, we, we think ourselves as a, like a blue collar band that we can do anything. And we've been doing this so long that we real. I think we're 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 really musicians now we can we can we can play so i think we're we it's something that we think of that we can probably do and tackle anything on any record it's not we're just relegated to you know that loud quiet loud or you know a pop song or whatever like that yeah but so for going back to server rosa i think because of the the way the, the band was progressing it was welcome it was welcome um especially in europe and then it just was just yeah if it, it it was a progression of the Pixies, and um, yeah, it was, I can't say anything else about it. But it was it was accepted. Yeah, you know, something I find amazing is just how diverse the age range of your fan base is. You continue to grow with younger generations who are not only discovering your music from their parents, but also your music going viral on places such as TikTok. Yeah. How does it make you feel knowing that you are maintaining relevance and appeal to do, to new generations of fans? It's quite, it's surreal. Um, you know, we we saw this back in two thousand and four when we did Coachella. When we did Coachella, mm -hmm. it was a sea of kids that were sing along. Now that was two thousand and four. We're jumping ahead now, uh, almost twenty years later. Those kids have grown up. They're going to shows, but they're being replaced with fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year olds. When you when you go to a Pixie show, I'll, I can see the people coming in before they come in. It's a sea of kids. They're the ones waiting it out, waiting for that door to open for general admission. And they come in, they're in the front row. I mean, all the older people like me are, you know, are in the back. They know all the, the old songs. Where's all my the, seat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> all the kids know every word to the all the albums that we did, all the new stuff. They they're singing along, and it's it's absolutely crazy. It's um it's 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 a joy to see. I think we're very fortunate as a band, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse. I mean, since the last tour and everything, that it's getting more and more and more kids who are just taking it over. I'm not saying that in a bad way. I I think it's it's wonderful. It's it's fantastic. Um, I just got to keep, I think I got to get my stamina up a little more to keep going and, and doing this. But I it's... feel you. I, I feel you. I mean, I'm in the pit shooting you guys and it's, and I have all these younger kids coming in and you know, it's like 10 o'clock and I'm like, I'm ready for bed. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm telling my manager, like, why can't we have earlier shows or why can't we only instead of two hour shows, can we do an hour and a half? You know, that's <laughs> and you know the thing is is that still there's very few bands that play such a long set um yeah. it's it's just not they're just not there i mean i mean i shoot how many shows a year and maybe two or three bands out of the whole year will play a set longer than 50 minutes yeah what's interesting is i now i i i I do in, in in my mind. I agree that I think a, like a ninety minute show is fantastic. That's the right yeah. time. I mean, it, it's the perfect time. Whereas if they don't like you, you're 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 off in ninety minutes. If they do like you, you leave them wanting more. But yeah. two hours two hours is a little little too much. I mean, just in yeah. my in my the way the shtick that that things get done. But then again, we're a band that doesn't we do what we want, and it's going to be two hours, no speaking, and just bam 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 yeah. bam given everything so that's what we do well gearing up for the north american tour how does it feel to be getting ready for three a three-leg north american summer tour and a festival season yeah. which shows are just selling out fast yeah uh america i love i mean america is it's it's very convenient it's very easy to do because you're very familiar with with mm -hmm. everything the way things work um, it's easy to do laundry in America compared to other places in the world. <laughs> so America is good good for that. But um, I'm looking forward to it because it's fun, I'm, especially my British Q crew love it. I mean, they love playing America, especially during the summer. It's just, it's the best. And um, what's interesting, interesting about it, Brooke, is it's three legs. The first leg is the most arduous. Um, it's only three weeks, I think, that we're doing. But all those shows are our own solo shows where it's the two hour shows, two hour shows, two hour mm -hmm. shows. A couple of them, they might be an hour show, hour and a half somewhere, or they don't want it there, but it's not long. It's very, it's going to be a little work at the top. And in fact, this whole tour is going to be a lot of work because it's not, when you look at an itinerary, uh, there are there are two words. There's shows, there's days off, and there's travel days. Those are the three things you see. Yeah. And days off are wonderful to see when you see that ready days <laughs> off. The majority of these tours coming up are travel days. So those those days off are on travel days, which means you do a show, you get in the bus at night, and then you're driving to the next place. Yeah. That's the travel day. There's a lot of them on this tour. This is a lot of work this tour will be. But but the 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 the, the bright side of it is the first three week part is gonna be, and I'm looking at only in the terms of oh, two hours. <laughs> <laughs> but the first one is going to be a little arduous. Then the tours after that, those are, I think, shed tours, amphitheater tours, festivals. Everything goes down to an hour and a half to an hour like that. So I'm like, yeah, this is going to, <laughs> this is going to be fun the, 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 the rest of the tour. But I'm looking forward to it. Next year, you'll just sleep the whole year. <laughs> I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Um, are we still going with the rule of no set list allowed when it comes to the yes. Pixie shows? Yeah, um, we've we've kept up that for a while now. I think that we we did a set list. We did one set list. It was either the last tour or the tour before it. I, I think I, it was the last tour because we brought it up in one of the interviews. It was like the one and only time. And then yeah. you guys were like, nah. <laughs> yeah, and there was, there was a reason for it. I don't remember if we were being filmed or it was an audio recording. There was a reason we had to write a set list, but that was the first one in a while. And it was just, it was, it was weird because I'm so used to not doing it where time goes by. You have no idea when the end is going to be. Yeah. Cause you, you have no reference to anything. So it was interesting having to look down and like, Oh, 
<laughs> there we are. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> are there any particular cities or venues on the upcoming tour that you're particularly excited about? Oh, gosh. Um, like maybe places that you haven't played before or places that you really enjoyed playing at? I It's, it's interesting, bro, because I, I looked at the schedule. I looked at the the, the cities. No Detroit on the list. I know that. I know that. Uh, no I'm going to have to come to Chicago. There's a lot of places. Um, uh, my friend in many, uh, Minnesota, the same. There's, uh, there's a lot of states that are being, uh, that weren't on the routing and stuff like that. And hopefully sometime in the future. But um, gosh, I think it's more that I'm not going to these places than places that I haven't been or... I'm looking forward to it's um because well, I have I, a lot of friends I have a lot of friends that have asked me why are you coming here so it's it would have been nice to see them so well I know one of your first festivals that you're playing is the Redondo Beach Life Festival um oh, yeah. I'm actually flying in from Detroit to shoot the festival I'm really oh, I'm really excited to see you guys um do you prefer to kind of start off your tours with something like a, a festival to kind of get the energy going, or do you prefer to play your, your solo, your solo shows first? Yeah, I've never, uh, it's interesting because we, when you do solo shows, your own shows, you have all production, you have control over it. Those are nice, but you want to do festivals. When you do festivals, those are nice, but you want to do your own shows. They're, they're, they're both lovely, but I've never been asked, you know, do you want to start off with a with a festival or your own show, which is interesting. Um, the energy is completely different. It is. It is. But I, I think I think the preference for us would be to do our own show just because there's a little more control of what could go wrong being the first show. You know, yeah. uh, you don't want to. It's easier to mess up or at least have, got, you know, some control on something on a first show compared to a festival where there might be a lot more people to see you screw up. <laughs> and so, but we're looking forward to that because that's going to be, it's a unique one being on the beach. And yes. you know, I don't think we've done anything like that on the water or on the ocean. It's it, a really nice area. I actually lived there for 10 years. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You guys will really enjoy it. I want to switch I'm, gears a little bit though. I want to talk about some of your hobbies. Yeah. Um, they're uh, very interesting. Okay. Well, um, at Redondo one, Beach, metal detector. I might bring my metal detector with me. So. <laughs> oh, I'll come with you. There. Oh, it's so much fun. There's yeah. so many places to take your metal detector. I will. I will come nerd out with you on that one. I mean, I have done from San Diego to Santa Barbara for 30 years. Those those beaches. I've covered that entire that entire line there, and it's 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 a blast. But you know, but continue. That's I'm sorry, bro. No, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was um, metal detecting. It's something you've been doing for a really long time. Um, how is, you know, how did you get into, you know, into that hobby? Well, I grew up in Massachusetts and where I grew up, uh, I lived in a suburban town called Burlington and it was bordered by Lexington, Bedford, Concord. So it was all revolutionary. Oh, all yeah. In the woods, just in the woods behind my house, there was foundations from the 1600s. 1700s mm -hmm. and just you know growing up in those woods and walking around i used to find um oyster shells when the when the ground would thaw and it would be springtime oyster shells would come out of the ground and i'm thinking as a little little kid there's land oysters i didn't know there were land oysters that you know there's always there's ocean was only there but there's land oysters and it wasn't until being a little more educated, I learned that was the major uh, diet of revolutionary, you know, of, of those times, colonial times. And they, what they do is there was so much, I mean, they're everywhere throughout the woods. And what they do is because they're made of mainly calcium and other things, they only change color. They don't degrade. They just, you'll see a white oyster shell come up. But anyway, that was, that, that, that piqued my interest of, of, of history. And then, you know, knowing and seeing all these, you know, cellar holes and stuff like that, I really got into history of, of colonial times. So, and also I'm an electronic geek. I was into electronics. I'm an engineer, blah, blah, like that. So because of that, you know, electronics and a thing that can make me find, you know, historical stuff, that's what got me into metal detecting. And I've done it since I was probably 11 years old. And from the woods just behind my house, I have coins from 
1724 all the way up all silver coins uh coppers old coppers large ones mm -hmm. i found also a lot of um revolutionary things like um uh, musket parts um eating utensils musket balls i have a load of musket balls but um when i moved to california um it's a lot it's not as old and but i had the ocean near me so that's where i bought an underwater detector and i started going in the ocean and finding gold gold rings gold rings chains watches all that stuff and that is primarily what i hunt now um there's a few places around here that i can hit that are 1800s and stuff like that as far as dating but the ocean is a lot more easier to, easier to hunt because you're just digging down through sand yeah and it's a lot easier than having a trowel or something going on land to do it but um and you're out in an idealistic place just you know the beach is awesome. Also, I wanted to ask about your device that you created that illuminates scorpions. Oh, what yeah, is, yeah. And how in the world does something like that work? Well, scorpions, uh, a lot of arachnids will glow. Their shell will glow under ultraviolet light. It's just whatever the, whatever the chemical makeup or whatever is in the shell, especially scorpions. All, I think all scorpions will fluoresce. And... Uh, I found there was a, uh, who was it? In a lot of department stores, I think it was um, whoever makes makeup, uh, you know, uh, whoever made makeup at one of those, you know, the big salon counters in those department stores where you get all your, your eyeshadow and all that mm -hmm. stuff. One of them was selling, was their way of marketing was taking this device, which was a, a small little battery, battery powered little thing with an ultraviolet bulb in it. And they showed it on your face. And when it lit up your face, it showed everything from sun damage. You looked horrific when you put it on your face. And they still do. They, you put it on any part of your skin, and it looks horrible. But that's what sold all their makeup and stuff like that. But um, it was discontinued because it was the wrong thing to do. And they had. I found an electronic surplus place that had a, a huge box of them. So I bought them and I retrofitted them just made because they would go off after 30 seconds because they would heat up. So I, I modified them and put some heat sinks in so they stay on indefinitely now. And I mounted two of them on an old metal detecting shaft. And the main reason was to hunt fluorescent rocks and minerals because a lot of minerals fluoresce and you can find uh, cool rocks that glow different colors. But I knew or I learned that they they work with scorpions too. So when I would where I live is a lot of dry area in California, especially when I go out to the desert. And that you just go around and you find little holes with baby scorpions come out coming out. And oh my gosh. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, they just glow and it's just it's this great look. It's fantastic. <laughs> oh goodness. That's I mean, I guess I guess that would be good. So you know, kind of not. This, where to stop too <laughs> yeah 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 one time in my garage here um i have a garage uh in my garage i was just moving stuff and it was called a great hairy scorpion it was <gasps> it was this big that big it had died it got out of the garage and died but I, it was it somehow it, it made its way in and you don't see those they're kind of rare to see a scorpion that big or that type but that was that was a thrill to see that um, yeah. Can you talk about your involvement with Magic Castle in Holly in Hollywood and the community and culture there? Yeah, um, I lived in Los Angeles for um, the predominance of my time in California. Um, I went to a magic convention. I had a friend, Grant Lee Phillips, um, who was into magic when he was younger. And there was a magic convention happening in Los Angeles. So we both went. And now I had... I hadn't done really magic. I didn't think anything of magic, but I went and I saw a professional magician do something where he took a cigarette and go through a quarter. And it wasn't your typical method that you see David Blaine do or anything like this. It was a, a completely different method. But anyway, I was, and this was before David Blaine anyway, this is before magic became on TV and stuff like that. But it blew me away. And from that point, I bought every book. I bought every video. I took classes. I worked my way up to join the Magic Castle. I did everything to become a professional magician. And eventually just through practice, 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 practice. And you, I have to admit, Brooke, I had, I had a lot of free time because the band had broke up. 
and this was my career choice. You know, <laughs> you know, you you hear the starving musician, but it's the dying magician. You know, it was a, it was a wise <laughs> thing that I picked, but um, it was wonderful because it, it 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 was a whole new thing that I was just in love with, and it was a different way of you know one on one rather than me being in a band where um I had four three people in front of me. My first magic show I did um in front of 10 people at someone's house and it was the first time with me just me after that show i could have taken my t-shirt and filled up a dixie dixie cup with with sweat that's how nervous and nerve-wracking it was but magic has been wonderful because magic has gives you confidence because mm -hmm. you learn to deal with people on a one-on-one -on -one or like that so it, it builds confidence it gives you just skills like i could be i i could do public speaking no problem right now whereas before magic forget it i i could not do anything like that but um it's magic has been wonderful in that way is building confidence and just the other part of it is um i guess giving a sense of wonder uh when someone's accepted to magic and you're doing a trick it kind of suspends belief and it gives a sense of wonder, maybe you not you might not have had since you were a kid, that kind of thing. And so that's what's, yeah, those things are great about magic. Uh, I've worked at the Magic Council for a number of years. Um, magic Council is near and dear to me. It saved my life in a, in a number of ways. And it's a magical magic, place. <laughs> it is, it is. And I, I, was, I was part of the family there and it was near and dear to me. And a lot of magicians I've met, I'm, I knew everybody because that's the Mecca for magic. People, magicians move from all around the world, just move to Hollywood, just to go to be at the magic castle. It's a, it's a life. And um, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And then when I moved away, I kept my, I kept my membership for a number of years because what the magic castle to get in, you have to know a magician. You yeah. can only buy the there. So now that I live up in the Santa Inez Valley, I'm, I'm about three, three and a half hours out of Los Angeles. Um, but over time, I was getting less frequent for me to get down to Hollywood and get to the Magic Castle. So I finally gave up my, um, my uh, membership there. Crazy thing was, um, Milt Larson, who owns the Magic Castle, lives up in Montecito, which is up here by Santa Barbara. He bought a place called the Cadel Soul in Montecito, which is about a half an hour, 20 minutes from me, mm -hmm. turned it into the Magic Castle Cabaret. So now there was a, ma a mini Magic Castle up where I live. So immediately I went, I joined, I did everything to help the place get started. I got a magic wand on the wall there. I was, I, I was part of this. I was, this is a joy because I'm going to get my friends now all up here that I have. We're going to come to the Magic Castle Cabaret. It's an awesome place. They, it was just a mini magic castle. I went there three times and then COVID hit. And the place got shit, closed down for two years. When they reopened because of logistics and people not wanting to work, they had to close down and shut down. So it no longer exists. But at least I got I got three visits there. <laughs> so Well, we have about five minutes left. Do you think that maybe you would have time to show us a trick? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Brooke, I have something I can teach you. It's a magic trick I can teach you. And all it involves is a paper bag. You can see that paper bag. Mm -hmm. I'll try to fill this up with the camera and a bottle. And all you do is you place the bag, the bottle into the bag. Hold on. There we go. Like that. Now, to teach you, all you got to do is snap your fingers. I have it the easy way. I just got to put some pixie dust on it. So if, let me get my beard. Okay, there we go. Got some pixie dust in there. And with that, the bottle vanishes. You can turn it over. Look at that. Is that amazing? It's gone. It's gone. Is that something? Do it again. I'll, I'll watch this. This time, I'll do pixie dust again. Get my dandruff in there. There we go. And the bottle returns. Is that something? Oh, wait a minute. Well, let me try this again. Let me put it in here again. Okay. Wave my hand over pixie dust. The bottle, it's, oh, wait a minute. You don't like this. Damn. Okay. I'll, I'll try something else. Okay. <laughs> Yay. That was awesome.
go. <laughs> like, glad you liked it, Brooke. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me um, in Folk and Rock today. We're really excited for your North American tour. I'm hoping to catch you in Chicago. I will be seeing you guys at the Redondo Beach Life Festival um, on May 5th. I'll, I'll be waving. <laughs> You'll see me. You can't miss me. <laughs> well, I will I'll see you. Yeah. And um, we're we're we just we love your stories, and you know, thank you for sharing them with me, um, and with your and with your readers and your fans. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us or your um your fans? The only thing I can say is, if you've never seen the Pixies. I've always I always say this. Um, we're not an antisocial band. As we've been talking, we do two hours. We don't speak at all to the audience. We don't say mm -hmm. hello. Nothing. It's not being antisocial. We're just doing what we do best. And that's it. Yeah. And it's it's an amazing show. I encourage everyone out there that is watching this or reading this to please run and grab tickets to the Pixies North American Tour this year. You will not regret it. Awesome thing. Thanks, Brooke.